Thank you for presenting, uh, coming here. Our, uh, <coughs> move the microphone, please. The focus of our work was to generate a base catalyst which would have shape selective properties. And so, of course, we'd like to use a zeolite. The emphasis was to develop a basic phlogocyte type zeolite and hopefully apply it in their latter part of this talk to a base catalyzed reaction. This work was uh, completed by uh, my dissertation with uh, Professor Mark Davis at the Department of Chemical Engineering at Virginia Tech. Briefly, the outline is... Uh, first area was the outline was the development and characterization of the basic phlogocyte type zeolite and also the nature of the active base site. We presented this earlier, but I'd like to recap just to catch everyone up and then move into some of the applied side where we are looking at the side chain alkylation of toluene with methanol form styrene. So firstly, moving into the development characterization. Of course, everyone's familiar with the phlogocyte structure, three-dimensional pore network. It's the sodalite cages adjoined by double six-member rings forming the large super cage inside with a pore diameter between seven and eight angstroms. We synthesize all our materials in our laboratory, so we're assured of the purity, and we know that there's a minimal amount of impurities. Our characterization scheme in characterizing acid-base properties, we chose isopropanol decomposition. Here I have the isopropanol molecule reacting in a parallel pathway. Excuse me. Focus. 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 I tried, it doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> Back there. Someone back there, perhaps. Thank you. Uh, again, we're looking at a parallel reaction pathway, considering a base catalyzed reaction going to acetone and hydrogen, a dehydrogenation, and the acid catalyzed, presumably a Bronsted acid elimination, the propylene water. And by monitoring the activity and selectivity of our products, we have an inference as to what the acid base properties of our solid. I'd like to mention, however, there's been some considerable work with temperature program desorption, temperature program reaction, and suggests that if an isopropoxide forms on a metal oxide, we can have abstraction of a beta hydrogen forming the propylene in absence of a bronsted acid site. So with the propylene formation, there could be some ambiguity as to whether it's being formed by a bronsted acid site or over metal oxygen anion, perhaps. So in our particular work, we wanted to optimize the activity and selectivity to acetone, and with most uh, confidence, therefore, that catalyst could be perhaps applied to another base catalyzed reaction. Uh, some of the advantages of this reaction scheme are it can be done at reaction temperatures, and we'll demonstrate this in the latter part of our work. Under steady state conditions as well, and simple ease of analysis, again, we're just monitoring the products coming off the reactor with an online GC. And of course, the major disadvantage is we cannot distinguish between base number and base strength, like a titration method would, or maybe a desorption method. As far as our catalyst variables we considered on the earlier part of this work was firstly the silicon to aluminum ratio. That is the X-type phytocyte versus the more siliceous Y-type. We also considered the exchange cation, the group 1A alkali metals, that is the sodium through cesium. Once we optimize the silicon aluminum ratio with the cation, again optimizing acetone selectivity and activity, we then looked into the absence and presence of the occluded exchange salt. That is we're taking the parent sodium form to the respective alkali form via an alkali hydroxide, acetate, nitrate, chloride solutions, typically a 0.1 normal. Our results suggested the following, that the best catalyst as far as acetone activity and selectivity was in fact the Y type, not the X type. Our particular <coughs> material had a 2.34 ratio. Uh, for cation was a cesium. As far as going from the sodium Y to the respective cesium Y, we had a cesium hydroxide, acetate, nitrate were pretty much similar as far as acetone activity and selectivity. We found very poor results of the chloride exchange, most likely due to residual chloride ions, perhaps. One of the most important steps, what we consider to be novel in this work, and pretty much focused on, was an impregnation of the cesium Y zeolite with, on average, of two acetate molecules per unit cell. And the impregnation was achieved by simply mixing the Y zeolite in an aqueous solution of cesium acetate and then evaporating off the bulk water, simply a rotovap uh, preparation. Uh, the material, let me just say how we pre-treated the material. Typically, we would impregnate it. We would then charge it into the reactor. We would take it up, say, 500 degrees, up to 600 degrees. We did calcination studies in oxygen atmosphere as well as helium. And then we'd lower down the reaction environment. We'd then uh, pass isopropanol helium mixture over and uh, get our respective selectivity and rates. 
To demonstrate this, I've chosen three catalysts, specifically here, zeolites. These are a rate comparison at 350 degrees. We're looking at intrinsic rates measured at differential conversions, again, steady state rates as well. An important point is that these rates are based on a molar unit cell basis to account for differences in the density of the materials. Uh, let's focus on the first two materials first. We have a cesium X and a cesium Y, both prepared with two acetate molecules on average per unit cell. The first thing we see is that the Y material outperforms the X material considerably by about four to five times. Also, if we look at the selectivity of the Y material, we see that we're here is around 97% selected to acetone. The X material is only around 60. One thing we had to convince ourselves, so if there is an influence of the silicon to aluminum ratio, is that with the cesium X material, thermodynamically more difficult to ion exchange. Therefore, for this, we see there's, there's 26 sodium cations here in the unit cell. Some of them are inaccessible to exchange because of their location in the sodalite cages. However, there's still approximately 12 to 14 sodium cations still available for exchange. So the probability exists that perhaps while we're doing impregnation, we could be doing ion exchange and we result in sodium acetate impregnation as opposed to cesium acetate. So what we prepared was a partially exchanged Y. We have a considerable number of sodium ions still available for exchange. Due to the impregnation, we still see the promotional effect. I might add, had we not impregnated the Y materials, the activity would be down this level, comparable to the X material. So again, the majority of the activity we're seeing is from the impregnation technique and the decomposition of the acetate itself. Take cesium acetate and then put on silica gel, just to see what was the influence of the uh, support again. Here we're looking at a comparable weight load at 2.4 weight percent on the cesium Y and a silica gel. On a gram basis, you can see we see uh, just trace acetone activity and propylene from the silica gel. Again, nice influence of the zeolite to working for us because now we can do shape selectivity as well, hopefully. How active are these materials was our question we wanted to address. Compare it to magnesium oxide, commercial base catalyst. <coughs> Again, rate comparison at 350 degrees, intrinsic differential conversions. Uh, on a surface area basis, the impregnated Y performs quite comparably to the magnesium oxide, both activity and selectivity, to the acetone. On a volume basis, you see that we're about four times more active than magnesium oxide. So it appears that we have a nice activity as well. We have nice selectivity. We're using a zeolite. Everything seems to be nice. Uh, the question we want to address now is potential for shape selectivity. Now this is a large pore zeolite. The potential may not be as high, say, as a small pore zeolite, but again, we'd like to eventually apply the technology to a smaller pore zeolite. <coughs> Let's look at the uh, location of the decomposition product. We want to do shape selectivity. It would be essential that the decomposition products are inside the zeolite and not on the extra crystalline surface. So what we looked at was a simple uh, surface to bulk analysis of cesium Y. Let's address our attention to the top. If we could focus maybe again, please. <coughs> Here we're looking at uh, two catalysts, a parent cesium Y and an impregnated acetate Y. With our weight impregnated, hmm. there we go. <laughs> okay. We have our uh, respective weight impregnation. Of course, we have none for the, in, uh, the cesium Y. We have around 1.95 <coughs> weight impregnated cesium. We then calcine these materials in a helium atmosphere at 450 and then submit them for chemical analysis. We're looking at the cesium to silicon ratio. Here's the chem bulk chemical analysis, our XPS data, where we're looking at, say, the first 50 angstroms of the surface of the crystal. We then ratio these analysis, and we get an, an assessment as to the, how well dispersed the cesium is. And you see for the cesium parent form, we're near unity, which we might expect, suggesting that the cations are well dispersed in the crystal. Interestingly, for our impregnated material, we're at unity again, suggesting evidence that the products are not on the outside surface, but well dispersed. To support this evidence, we look at some work by Shannon et al., who looked at rhodium exchanged onto a Y zeolite and a sodium form A zeolite. Rhodium here being in a plus three oxidation state will form a large radius of hydration during ion exchange in the aqueous solution. You can see for the Y, at a 2.3 weight percent loading, it appears that we do in fact have ion exchange when we compare the rhodium to silicon ratio for the analyses, suggesting the rhodium has passed into the zeolite and has ion exchanged. Interesting with the sodium A, small polar zeolite, you see at 1.25 weight percent rhodium, our analysis theirs for that matter, is near 60. 
This evidence coupled with ours, again, suggests that the acetate decomposition products, even at a 1.95 weight loading, are intercrystalline. We now have potential to do shape selectivity. <coughs> the question we want to address is what is the decomposition product? We're taking cesium acetate, we're uh, supporting on a YZ light, thermally decomposing it, again, oxygen or helium environment. Some of the possible candidates we considered were an esoteric cesium cluster, uh, zero valence or ionic, probably unlikely, but there was some work earlier by Woods et al who observed cesium metal in the vapor phase over carbonates at 600 degrees C. Uh, Garces has uh, surmised that perhaps cesium X, which could absorb CO2 from the air, could form carbonate species on the surface, and then perhaps you could see cesium metal in the vapor phase over the X material, and it happened, and in fact reported it between 300 and 350 degrees C. Lastly, there was some work recently by Martins et al. looking at isomerization of one butene over a sodium metal cluster in sodium Y had very nice activity. He suggested there was a promotional effect of the sodium metal into the lattice oxygen producing a promotional effect of the activity. So with these three pieces of work there was a possibility that perhaps cesium metal could be formed, uh, lie on the surface and perhaps promote the acetone formation. Uh, ESR spectroscopy however suggested not. We saw no signal of cesium metal. Furthermore we calcined these materials in oxygen at 450 degrees C and we would expect the cesium metal which would have a high affinity for oxygen would be uh, eliminated and uh, Martins et al. had trace oxygen in his reaction uh, stream and saw suppression in activity. We in fact saw a slight promotion as a result of calcining in an oxygen atmosphere. So we've uh, at this point not, at this point in time we're not considering cesium chloride as, or cesium clusters as a possible candidate. Carbonate, uh, simply we looked at the material in in-situ FTIR looking for the carbonyl stretch, no evidence of it after calcination. Furthermore, we've taken cesium carbonate and charged it in the reactor. Again, no conversion of the isopropanol. So we don't consider cesium carbonate to be a likely suspect at this point in time. Cesium oxide, I've shown it here as CXOY, <coughs> forms various phases. First thing we did was simply bought some cesium oxide crystals, ground them up to a powder, charged them to the reactor, get nice activity, very nice selectivity at 99% selective acetone. Furthermore, again, I mentioned we calcine these materials in an oxygen atmosphere. At 450 degrees, a very high oxidizing atmosphere, and we see a slight promotion in activity relative to helium. And we might expect the acetate to decompose to an oxide, ox, uh, an oxide at those kind of conditions. So at this point in time, we'd like to suggest that we have an intercrystalline cesium oxide as our active site. So just to uh, surmise thus far on the catalyst on the earlier work, on, uh, it appears that for the cesium acetate impregnated cesium Y zeolite, we have a highly active intercrystalline base site generated from the decomposition of the cesium acetate. The cesium acetate Y possesses a high surface area, around 500 meters squared per gram, an exceptional activity and selectivity relative to magnesium oxide. And we also, from the XPS data, we have potential for shape selectivity. Again, not so much for the phlogocyte large pore zeolite, perhaps applying this technology to the smaller pore zeolites. As far as the nature of the acetate decomposition product, it appears to be a cesium oxide. We now have uh, pretty much touched on the earlier work and what we presented earlier. I'd like to now go into something a little more applied. And that would be the side chain alkylation of toluene with methanol to styrene. This reaction uh, has been around for about 20 years. It's uh, two folds we're looking at. This one, it's considered to be a base driven reaction. And two, it's an industrially significant product, that is the styrene. The desired reactions proposed is one, the dehydrogenation of methanol to formaldehyde and hydrogen. Then there was an abstraction of the proton from the methyl group to form a carbanion, which is reacted with the formaldehyde to form the styrene in an aldol elimination type reaction. I guess what a lot of volume? Yeah. Okay. Can everyone hear? Okay. Uh, some of the undesired reactions are the uh, Oxidation of formaldehyde to CO and hydrogen, of course, we're eliminating our proposed reactant. Furthermore, the ring alkylation to form the xylenes, perhaps over most likely an acid site. And the hydrogenation of styrene to ethyl benzene. Again, we're trying to make styrene. Some of the previous work, just to recap, to get an idea of where everyone stands on this, uh, as far as activity, the X, cesium X usually outperforms the Y as far as activity and selectivity of styrene. Interestingly, metal oxides behave very poorly, and we'll show this uh, with some of our own data. Some of the further improvements on the X material are the impregnation of an alkalized salt, boric acid, 
copper nitrate, combinations of the above. Again, we're trying to optimize seal activity uh, styrene and also trying to promote stability of formaldehyde. And some of these methods have worked well. Problem we're having though, is it does not compete at this point in time with commercially uh, used reaction. That is the alkylation of benzene with ethane and subsequently the dehydrogenation of the styrene. At this point in time, the activity and seal activity is not, uh, I guess, mature enough at this point in time to compete. So we'd like to look at this reaction, use our catalyst. So in this work, we have what the acetate impregnated Y zeolite, we have acetate impregnated X zeolite. We have a lot of fundamental background on the characterization of this material from isopropanol decomposition, a good feel for the preparation techniques. We'd now like to study the relationship between isopropanol decomposition <coughs> and side chain alkylation to better infer if we can maybe produce a better catalyst or maybe get some insight as to what's wrong with the previous catalysts. So if we're going to do a relational study between isopropanol decomposition and side chain alkylation, again, I mentioned we can do this study at reaction temperatures. So we want to look at isopropanol decomposition at reaction temperatures. So let's optimize our temperature as far as toluene alkylation. This is influence of temperature on the conversion of toluene to styrene. Uh, here we have two catalysts, our cesium Y and our X, as a function of temperature. And this is consistent with the previous work. We're optimizing between around 425, 435, and that's very consistent with previous work. So now we want to do our isopropanol, not at 350, but let's move it up to 425 because we know activity as well, CELAC is dependent on temperature, and that's what we're getting our inference as to the solid acid base properties. So now we're going to look at the isopropanol decomposition at 425 for our two catalysts. Here we have isopropanol decomposition at constant contact time. Our conversion of isopropanol and yield of acetone, of course the difference being that of propylene. And you can see at 425, again, our impregnated Y zeolite outperforming the X by about threefold. These conversions, however, are not at differential conversions. Let's look at selectivity at constant conversion now. Here it's constant conversion, conversion of 4.73 isopropanol, and you can see again the Y outperforming the X. The Y being around 95% selectivity to acetone, the X being near 50. At this point in time, we're kind of excited. We have a nice cast, looks very well at 425. Again, these are steady state rates or yields. It appears that we might have a promotional effect in the toluene to styrene conversion. However, uh, look here at the toluene alkylation with methanol results, conversion of toluene, yield of styrene, the difference being ethyl benzene, we observe no xylenes. The materials behave quite similarly. We were uh, kind of uh, disappointed. We would expect perhaps the Y to be four and five, maybe two times more active than the X. We did not see that. Uh, one of the uh, possible explanations is, if we look at the next slide, is if we monitor the influence of temperature on methanol decomposition during alkylation. What's happening to the methanol? And here I've shown, let's direct our attention to the top graph firstly. Here we have yields as a function of temperature going from 380 up to 480 during alkylation. You can see with our X material, we observed the formaldehyde in the product stream consistent with the proposed mechanism the formaldehyde is reacting. However, for the Y material, there's no formaldehyde in the product stream. Inversely, we see high CO formation in the product stream of the Y compared to the X. Okay? So it appears at the time we might have a problem with stability of formaldehyde. This is consistent with previous work by the impregnation of boric acid, etc. Trying to promote stability <coughs> of uh, the formaldehyde. So for our cast, it appears at this point in time that the formaldehyde seems to be our weakest link as far as keeping it stable with these uh, more basic conditions. I just want to touch briefly on this table. I hope you can see, there's a lot of data here. I just want to point out two, two effects. Uh, I want to just move into who to influence the topology because I want to make a point on this at our further directions, our future directions. Here we're looking at side chain alkylation of toluene at 300 or 425 for two catalysts, the cesium Y and a magnesium oxide compared on a surface area basis and you can see with consistent with earlier results, the toluene conversion to styrene is around 2.7, magnesium oxide zero. We saw, however, magnesium oxide behaves quite similarly in isopropanol <coughs> decomposition to our prepared material, both at 350 degrees and at 425. Interestingly, they have similar uh, methanol decomposition products during alkylation. Here's our formaldehyde, both trace material, trace uh, presence in both for both materials. Also, we see high CO production. So it does appear to be an influence of topology, and again, I'd like to address this in our future studies. Overall conclusions, as far as the isopropanol decomposition work, uh, the decomposition of cesium acetate impregnated Y appears to result in the generation of a highly active intercrystalline base site. 
and this base site does not appear to form on a similar paired cesium X material. Furthermore, the high activity and selectivity for the Y impregnated Y material at 350 are maintained at 425. Furthermore, the decomposition product of cesium acetate scored on the Y appears to be an intracrystalline cesium oxide. As far as uh, the total inoculation work, it appears that an increase in base character promotes alkylation, but at the apparent expense of formaldehyde stability. Although the cesium Y magnesium oxide has similar isopropanol decomposition behavior as well as methanol decomposition products, toluene is not alkylated by MGO, suggesting a topological influence. This sort of moves us into our future directions in this work. As far as the characterization, we'd like to look at the influence of the silicon aluminum ratio. We saw that with the cesium X compared to the cesium Y. We did not get this promotional effect. We'd also like to couple this with cesium 133 mass NMR. There was a recent paper two months ago by Chu et al who looked at cesium uh, in different environments and could detect it by NMR, that is cesium chloride, nitrate, hydroxide, uh, formate. So what we'd like to do is perhaps couple synthesizing phosphates of various silicon to aluminum ratio, look at the isopropanol behavior with the impregnated material, and then couple that with cesium-133 NMR to give us insight as to the silicon aluminum ratio and also give us more evidence to the decomposition product, that is a suggested cesium oxide. As far as alkylation, we saw the influence of topology, at least between magnesium oxide and the phosphate type. So it would be interesting to us to perhaps apply this impregnation technique, of course we'd know more information on the silicon aluminum ratio, and apply that to the zeolite uh, influence on alkylation and try to promote the effect perhaps that way. Just to touch on some of our, our work that's available and soon to be available, hopefully. For alkali-modified zeolites, as far as published papers, we have the running title of Base Catalysis by Alkali-Modified Zeolites. That is the catalytic activity, nature of the active site, and a recently submitted paper in the alkylation with methanol.